Okay, go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Acts 14. That's where we'll be today. <clears throat> Before we get into that, though, I just want to review quickly last week's teaching on Acts 13. And just a, just a refresher that we, um, we whiteboarded the speeches of Stephen, Peter, and Paul... And we saw where some of the similar elements were, where there was a, a history, a bit of a historical review, some, something of a gospel message, whether it was a gospel of Yeshua or a gospel of Abraham or something about the, the salvation of redemption part of the story. And then ending with a kind of warning, whether it's if you do good, this will happen, or if you do bad, this will happen. So... So there was, that was the most basic structure. And then I encouraged y'all to come up with and start to write or outline or draft some kind of message you could give to an audience, to, to someone who is um, curious about um, God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Let's be specific about that. Um, and I started to draft mine. Anyone start to kind of think about or write? I know, you, Mark, you said you had started that, so that's cool. And this is something we can revisit um, um, in the future, too. But uh, I think it's a good practice to be like, okay, so if, if someone were to ask me, if I had like an elevator speech, at the time in an elevator to tell somebody, what would I say? How, how would I say it? What would I start with? Would I start with in the beginning? I mean, would I go all the way back there or, or what? So anyway, it's a good exercise just to kind of think, get, you, get your mind thinking about how to present the gospel to, to people. So we did that. Uh, we also noted about the, uh, the falling out that Paul and John Mark had and that Luke really doesn't get into it. He doesn't talk about it out of respect for both John Mark and Luke or and Paul. He doesn't say much about it, but we can tell because of, of how Paul's going to respond here in the next chapter in Acts. He didn't like the way John Mark left. So there was, there was some rift. There was some bitterness there, but they were still brothers and God still used them, even though they weren't united. He still used them to do some amazing things for the kingdom. John Mark, of course, went on to write the Gospel of Mark. And Paul went on to do all that Paul went on to do. So we can see that the humanity there of these individuals. We see how um, Paul and Barnabas chose the places they were going based on some local connections. So they would go someplace, and then based on connection or recommendation of people there, that's where they decided where they would go next. That's not written in the text, but it's, it is, um, there, there's a, a, a subtext there that's like, oh, they, they knew someone there. Sergius Paulus had property and knew people in Pisidian and Antioch, so that would have been a reason why they went there. So we, we see how, that, how they um, continued their journey based on who they met, where they were. Uh, and then finally we see how the Jews were not objecting to Yeshua. They weren't objecting to Yeshua. They were objecting to Gentile involvement. Uh, and we'll see this again here at the beginning of, of chapter 14. So just a review of 13. Um, so let's go ahead and get into it. But before we do that, let's go ahead and pray. And, uh, and then we'll, I'm going to read through the entire chapter. It's not very long. So let's go ahead and pray. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for uh, this warm place, in all the warm places we are all gathering uh, this morning to dig into your word, to, um, to uh, commit ourselves and devote ourselves to the apostles' teaching, to breaking bread, to prayer, uh, to fellowship. Um, and we just thank you for allowing us to be part of this journey. Uh, you're a good God, a good Father, um, and we thank you for Yeshua who guides us well through this. He's a good teacher. We also thank you for Paul and Barnabas uh, for the time they spent on this earth uh, doing your will, even when uh, it may have been hard for them to do. Uh, we thank you for their courage and their um, uh, willingness to submit to you. I pray that we can all be like that um, eventually. Um, we pray all this in Yeshua's name. Amen. Okay, Acts chapter 14. And I'll be reading from uh, New American Standard. <clears throat> in Iconium, they entered the synagogue of the Jews together and spoke in such a manner that a large number of people believed, both of Jews and of Greeks. But the Jews, 
who disbelieved stirred up the minds of the Gentiles and embittered them against the brethren. Therefore, they spent a long time there speaking boldly with reliance upon the Lord, who was testifying to the word of his grace, granting that signs and wonders be done by their hands. But the people of the city were divided, and some sided with the Jews and some with the apostles. And when an attempt was made by both the Gentiles and the Jews with their rulers to mistreat And to stone them, they became aware of it and fled to the cities of Lyconia, Lystra, and Derbe, and the surrounding region. And there they continued to preach the gospel. At Lystra, a man was sitting who had no strength in his feet, lame from his mother's womb, who had never walked. This man was listening to Paul as he spoke, who, when he had fixed his gaze on him and had seen that he had faith to be made well, said with a loud voice, "'Stand upright on your feet.'" And he leaped up and began to walk. When the crowds saw what Paul had done, they raised their voice, saying in the Lyconian language, the gods have become like men and have come down to us. And they began calling Barnabas Zeus and Paul Hermes because he was the chief speaker. The priest of Zeus, whose temple was just outside the city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates and wanted to offer sacrifice with the crowds. But when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of it, they tore their robes and rushed out into the crowd, crying out and saying, men, why are you doing these things? We are also men of the same nature as you and preach the gospel to you that you should turn from these vain things to a living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. In the generations gone by, he permitted all the nations to go their own ways. And yet he did not leave himself without witness in that he did good and gave you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. Even saying these things with difficulty, they restrained the crowds from from offering sacrifice to them. But Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, and having won over the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. But while the disciples stood around him, he got up and entered the city. The next day he went away with Barnabas to Derby. After they had preached the gospel to that city and made and had many and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, and saying, Through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. When they had appointed elders for them in every church, having prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. They passed through Pisidia and came into Pamphylia. When they had spoken the word in Perga, they went down to Italia. From there, they sailed to Antioch. Uh, This will be Syrian Antioch, from which they had been commended to the grace of God for the work that they had accomplished. When they had arrived and gathered the, the congregation together, they began to report all things that God had done with them and how he had opened a door of faith for the Gentiles. And they spent a long time with the disciples. Okay. Um, let, us, let us always keep in mind just how unprecedented all of this is. We are so familiar with Scripture. We're so familiar with these stories. We, we take for granted that, that these things are happening for the first time in many respects. Um, one thing I, I like to do, I'm a, I'm a movie guy, I love movies, and you know that when, when I teach, I always try to imagine a scene from a movie in these, some of these things that have happened in Acts. I was like, what if, you know, if Paul was Liam Neeson, right? Like, you know, they can't handle him, right? He's just, just like this. Um, so when I look at, when I watch some movies, I try to think of them or view them in their context, especially if, if a certain movie is, is, breaking a barrier or making a change in how movies are presented or, or uh, made. Because you have to think of what came before it, right? So if we're, if we're to take like an action movie, one of the greatest action movies of all time, um, we'll say um, Alien, sci-fi action, right? You're shaking your head, I know, whatever. Like we, can, we can have a debate about this. Um, but. What, what, what made it so special was because of what came before it. There was nothing else like it beforehand. 
And now there's something like this that we're, we take for granted. We've seen it. You know, we, we think maybe not too well of it. That's fine. We can we do that. But we have to remember the context in which it happened. And so all these things that are happening in Acts, we've got to remember just how unprecedented this is and how if it, if it gets messy, if it gets, um, you know, if, if, if some things happen that are just out of the ordinary, this is, this is so new and so fresh. Um, let's, just, let's just always keep that in mind. I just wanted to kind of preface um, this teaching with that. Okay, so... Going back to verse 1, it says that they entered into the Jewish synagogue. Again, we see that the strategy here is to go to where there are established Jewish communities. Because that's where Gentiles will have already been familiar with Adonai and where a community of people will be able to absorb them and and, uh, welcome them into this new community so they continue developing and learning about God and about Yeshua, because again, these people, these Jews, these believing Jews or non-believing Jews, did not have a problem with the message of Yeshua. And again, we see that the gospel message of Yeshua as the Messiah and about his death, burial, and resurrection is well received by both Jews and Gentiles. So this is again, this is not the issue. Verse 2, but the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. Again, we see some Jews didn't like the outcomes of Paul's gospel and how it produced an influx of Gentiles into this very distinct community with its own culture and society. And honestly, I, I can't blame them. I think that I would also feel threatened if we in our congregation of 150, 200, I don't know how many people, all of a sudden there was an influx of all these people. Maybe, maybe there was a, a church down the road that, that folded, and there were 300 people there. And for whatever reason, they all decided that this is where they needed to be. How much of a mix would there be in our own hearts of rejoicing, but also concern? Because now we're outnumbered by a people who have a different culture, have different values, as far as how it is we practice our faith, what it is we do. They, they're come, they've come to learn. Let's, let's give the benefit of that. They've come to learn, but we still know that there is something there that could potentially threaten. Raise your hand if you would feel both of those things. I certainly would, right? We, we all would. So we can't blame them for feeling the way they feel. Something else here, so if in that scenario where, you know, we, we're here in our congregation, let's add on to that an element of, of what the Jewish people had at the time. They had special treatment. In the t- during the time, the Greeks, the Gentiles, were required by law to worship the pagan gods. It was, it was civic duty. It was expectation. If you didn't, there was punishment. The exception was the Jewish people. The Jewish people did not have to do those things. Months ago now, I talked a little bit about this and that there is this now third category of people. There's Gentiles and Jews. There's a third category of people, an in-between people who by choosing to be in-between are putting themselves at risk. They're now violating law, violating the Roman law by not practicing this pagan, these pagan religions. But they're trying to come into this new community as Gentiles. So for the so if if this church down the road folds, these 300 people come, and some of us, some, some in our group are just like, you know, this is not a good idea. We have special rights and privileges, they do not. I know how to solve this. I can bring up to this group of Gentiles, hey, by the way, do you know you're breaking the law? This could go really bad for you. Maybe you should go back and maybe just go start your own church somewhere and do something else, right? Like if I wanted to do that, that's, that, that would be an easy target, right? Like, oh, bring up how this is gonna cause great discomfort to the people who are coming into this new community and see how they turn and run, right? Like if I'm trying to protect 
this, if I'm trying to protect our thing, I'm going to tell them, oh yeah, you're welcome as a guest, but if you really want to be part of this, you're going to break the law, and they're going to come for you, and it's not going to go well for you. Do you really want that? Mm, probably not. So why don't you go and keep doing your thing, and we'll do our thing, and we'll be happy, right? So this is, it's an obvious strategy. The Jews tolerated Gentiles as God, the God-fearers. They had for a while. It was fine. So long as there was a distinction, like, nope, okay, you're just, you're just a guest here. We're doing our thing. You can observe and watch. We, we love you for it. You're great. But in their minds, there was no third category. It was either Jew, fully Jewish, worshiping the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, or a Gentile who wasn't saved, who was a God-fearer, who was just this, this second-class citizen, uh, but not, there, there was no... Nothing on their radar said this people could become part of us and not have to become Jewish. It wasn't, wasn't on their minds. In Galatians, now, now Galatia is a very special place. This is where they're, they're going in Galatia, so Lystra and Derby and these places. Galatia is a special place. Special things happened here that resulted in the writing of the first epistle which is the epistle to the Galatians. That's the first epistle that was written. And it's the first book we have of our canonized uh, um, Greek scriptures. It's Galatians. So some very special things happened here. So if we look in Galatians 4, um, 8 through 11, I'll just read it here. This is Paul writing to the Galatians after having returned from them in, in this chapter here in Acts. He says, However, at that time when you did not know God, you were slaves to those which by nature are not gods. So he's talking about this polytheism. But now that you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God, how is it that you turn back again to the weak and worthless elementary principles to which you want to be enslaved all over again? You meticulously observe days and months and seasons and years. I fear for you that perhaps I have labored over you in vain. This is referring to their former life in paganism. So, polytheism, monotheism. This, this is the dichotomy we're dealing with, that he's dealing with now in this, in this place, in this chapter. Verse 3. So they remained for a long time, speaking boldly for the Lord. Because of the opposition that had grown and that was, um, that was making it, rearing its ugly head, they had to stick around for a time in each place to strengthen the community of new Gentile believers in this community in the gospel message. They had to do this. Uh, as, as they moved out of Iconium that had a, a large, uh, a significant Jewish population. Iconium was actually, we think, one of the oldest cities in the world. Very, very old city. There was a significant population. As he's moving eastward into Galatia more, he's going to experience less and less Jewish presence in these communities. And so he's having to stay and teach a little more about this, just to give them that foundation that they don't have if they were to be around um, a community of Jewish people in a synagogue. Verse 4, uh, but the people of the city were divided, some sided with the Jews and some with the apostles. Now, this is confusing here. The apostles are Jews. So it wasn't like all Jews and the apostles who aren't Jews. It was the Jews who did not believe, who were opposing this, and the Jews who did, which were the apostles. So that's a confusing wording there. And keep in, in, in mind here that the main point of the controversy in these chapters has nothing to do with Yeshua's Messiahship or his resurrection from the dead and everything to do with the threat of disruption that Gentile involvement created, period. That was it. You're not like us. So because of that, I'll reject wholesale everything Paul says, even though 10 minutes beforehand, I wanted to know more about this Yeshua, who's the Messiah and who raised from the dead. But my dislike of a certain people group was so great that I'll just throw everything else out. Yuck. <laughs> <clears throat> Moving on. Verse 5. 
When an attempt was made by both Gentiles and Jews with their rulers to mistreat them and to stone them, they learned of it and fled to Lystra and Derbe, cities of Lyconia, and to the surrounding country. So someone had tipped them off. They learned of it. Someone tipped them off and said, hey, uh, you better get out of here. And this person probably also told them where they should go next. And where they went next to Lystra was the hometown of what uh, apostolic writer? Or what a writer of an epistle? Someone lived in Lystra. Paul wrote two epistles to this individual. So there's only a few people you could think of. Who? Who? Timothy. Timothy lived in Lystra with his mother and grandmother. You remember their names? Lois and Eunice. That's right. So in Iconium, someone was like, you know, they're going to stone you. Why don't you go to Lystra? There's a nice family there. They'll take you in and they'll be good to you and you'll be safe there. Not a lot of Jews, so you're probably not going to come up against a whole lot of opposition when you go. Okay. So this is connections, right? We see that there's these, these connections. Also, um, Lystra, we know from history, was a, a particularly hospitable place. And we'll see this here in a little while when, we, when, when talking about Zeus and Hermes. In the values of their culture in Lystra was one of hospitality. So bookmark that, and I'll tell you why here in a minute. It's interesting. Um, and there they continue to proclaim the gospel. This is verse 7. So here we see in Lystra for the first time they weren't teaching in a what? In a synagogue. They weren't teaching in a synagogue. They were just teaching. They, they continued to teach. And we see when there is the, the, the lame man, the lame man isn't in the synagogue. He's out in the public square. So this is the first time we see Paul actually teaching and proclaiming in a public place. Okay. Now, there are two barriers here. We know that there's no synagogue, which means there is no what? Jewish presence. And if there's no Jewish pre significant Jewish presence here, there's also no what for these Gentiles? Access to the Torah. They know nothing about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Nothing. Okay, so here's a new kind of audience that Paul and Barnabas are speaking to. Before, they've been, they've been going to synagogues where there were Torah-observant, Torah-knowledgeable people, and the people who were in orbit around them, the Gentiles who were familiar with the culture and values of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the people, right? And now, here's a new audience of people who know nothing at all. And we'll see later on in the chapter how he changes his message to them in a way that will be received by them. So there's a religious, religious and philosophical barrier and a language barrier too. These are people who do not speak native. They don't speak Hebrew, certainly. Maybe they speak Greek, but we do know they speak Lyconian. But guess who doesn't speak Lyconian? Paul and Barnabas. They don't speak that language. Okay. The next three verses we see... Uh, uh, the, the lame man um, who, and, and what I would recommend you do if you write this down, a task for you to do maybe later today or in the next week, compare this passage of a lame man with another passage of a lame man being healed uh, earlier in, um, in Acts, where it was, uh, was it Peter? Peter healed the lame man. Compare those two side by side, noting what their ethnicity was, what they would have known, where they were, what their response was to being healed, what Peter said, what Paul said. Map those out. It's an interesting, interesting menorah pattern, um, and it's something that Grant has talked about before. So if you want, you can cheat and just go listen to his teaching on Acts uh, 14. Uh, but do that, and that'll, be, that'll give you some insight as to how the two different audiences re respond to being healed. Okay, so let's move on down to, chapter, to verse 11. So he's healed, 
Um, he, he sprang up and began walking. All right. Verse 11. And when the crowds saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in Lyconian, the gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. Paul and Barnabas at this point had no idea what they were saying. All they saw looking around them after, after doing this thing was people rejoicing, and I'm sure Paul and Barnabas were like, hey, this is, this is going good, right? <laughs> and again, I, this is a, a scene from a movie. We've probably seen this trope over and over again where someone comes and like, to a, a tribe in, you know, that's, that's never had any contact, and they say something, and then the tribes people are like, oh, yeah, like, oh, yeah, this must be going really good. And all of a sudden you see that they're carting them off to be sacrificed into a volcano or whatever, right? So it's like, it's like oh, this is, okay, they're happy. We said something. They must have liked it, right? Okay. So they have no idea that they just said, the gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. That's put in there because Luke heard about this after the fact, and he knows that that's what they said. But Paul and Barnabas didn't know until a, a verse or two later when the sacrifices started coming, then they were just like, whoa, 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 what's going on? So there's that language barrier. So let me tell you a quick little story that will answer this question about hospitality in Lystra and also why these people looked at Paul and Barnabas and thought, ah, the gods have come down to us. The story of Philemon and Bacchus, this is Greek mythology, has local significance to this area of Lystra because just north of it in Phrygia, there is a legend, a myth, about how Zeus and Hermes came down as men, as humans, and asked for a place to stay. And a family, this couple, Philemon and Bacchus, invited them in. They were very hospitable to them. And after that, they, they received riches and uh, they were thanked for their hospitality. But so, so in this polytheistic culture, there is this legend of something that happened nearby of Zeus and Hermes coming down and, and also speaking. Uh, Hermes is a messenger. Hermes is the messenger of the gods. That's why uh, Paul is thought of as Hermes in this scenario because he's the one who's speaking. Zeus and Hermes come down. They're, they're in disguise. So these people in their culture, they're looking. They're looking for Zeus and Hermes for generations, however long. Like, this is part of our culture. We know that it's possible that the, that the gods will come down in human form and we'll need to be hospitable to them, be kind to them, be good to them, and hear what they have to say. Okay? So some, some background into this culture and why this happening with Paul and Barnabas would lead them to go, oh, the gods have come, right? Okay. Verse 12. Barnabas, they called Zeus and Paul Hermes because he was the chief speaker. In depictions of these two gods, Bar uh, uh, Zeus is thought of as more fatherly, more wizened, a longer beard. Barnabas would have been that. Paul was athletic. Um, he may have had a shorter beard, and he was also the one speaking. Hermes was athletic, too. So to these, to these eyes, to these polytheistic eyes who are so versed in the story of Philemon and Bacchus and Zeus and Hermes, it's all adding up to them. It's so easy for them to think, oh, my goodness, that's, did he just, that must be Hermes. And yeah, that looks like Zeus. That guy looks like Zeus. Those scratchings on the cave wall look like him or whatever. So it, again, this is, this is a logical conclusion for people in this culture. Verse 13, and the priest of Zeus, whose temple was at the entrance of the city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates and wanted to offer sacrifices with the crowds. But when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard this, they tore their garments and rushed into the crowd crying out, so here is where they're finally catching on, like, oh, this isn't a big party that we just started. This is something, like, completely in the opposite direction, right? We're wanting to show them about the one true God. And here they are thinking that we're gods. Like, oh, oops. <laughs> big mistake, right? Jeffrey, are you a god? No. Am I a god? No. no. I might want you to think I am from time to time. 
<laughs> in our home. I'm God in the home. No. But think about what that, what, what, how would you respond if you were trying to teach someone and they thought you were the Messiah? Right? Like, what do you do with that? Had he ever, I wonder if he had ever, again, because this is all unprecedented, if he had ever been faced with that problem before. Maybe not. Probably not. This is new. Which is why it would have been so distressed, distressing to him and Barnabas that they tore their garments, rent their garments, and went and like, no, like, stop, time out, you know, pulled the cord of the, of the DJ stand, <laughs> the music stops, like, stop, right? Verse 15. So here we, here we see Paul is tailoring his message to a people with no familiar, familiarity with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, okay? Men, why are you doing these things? We also are men of like nature with you, that is not God's. And we bring you good news that you should turn from these vain things to a living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. So if the messages beforehand were about recounting the history of the Jewish people, the gospel message, doing maybe a midrash on something like the Davidic Covenant, uh, talking about uh, how, we, how we are justified through Yeshua and not through Torah, uh, and then a warning, if you don't do this, you'll perish. If you do do this, you'll be blessed. Like, that's a, that's a great speech, but not for this group of people. Where does, where does he start? He starts at zero. He's starting at zero with these people, basically saying, Polytheism, bad. Monotheism, good. <laughs> that's, that's basically it. And pointing to na natural things around. Nature. The God who made the stuff. Turn from these vain things. Like just basic, basic, basic language. Things you would tell a child. Really. He's, he knows he has to start from there. In the past, in past generations, verse 16... He allowed all the nations to walk in their own ways, yet he did not leave himself without witness, for he did good by giving you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with, good, with food and gladness. Again, the physical, things, that, things that, that I know you people here, you like to eat. That was God. You, you, have, you, you rejoice, you have happiness. That was God too. You reign, God. Seasons, God. The one God. The living God. So he's starting from zero, or nearly zero. I say nearly zero because these were polytheists. They still believed in something greater than themselves. I would say that maybe dealing with atheists is where you're starting from zero. Maybe. But even that's kind of complicated, too. Because atheism is derivative. <laughs> you can't have theism without, you can't have atheism without theism, right? Atheism is just a response to theism. Anyway, anyway that, that, that's, that's a, a rabbit hole. But he was starting it from nearly zero and pointing to the, how God revealed himself in nature. In, in Romans 1, 18 to 21, he, he comments on this further. He says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of people who suppress the truth and unrighteousness, because that which is known about God is evident within them. For God made it evident to them. He provided evidence. For since the creation of the world, so the physical space, his invisible attributes, that is, his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived, being understood by what has been made. So he's saying he has always had, there's always been evidence of him here in the physical world, in creation, right? Okay, verse 18. Even when these words, they scarcely restrained the people from offering sacrifice to them. Um, kids, 
How many of you like um, superheroes or um, Disney princesses or, or, or Star Wars characters <laughs> or all of these, all of these really cool uh, characters in shows and movies and cartoons? Raise your hand if you like any of those things. Yeah, right, okay. Imagine that you're going somewhere and you see someone, let's just say that you like Spider-Man, okay? Maybe you don't, but let's just pretend that you all like Spider-Man. You go somewhere and you see Spider-Man. You see Spider-Man. And you're like, oh my goodness, mom, dad, look, it's Spider-Man. I can't believe it. And you go up to him, and you start talking to him, and then for whatever reason, he takes his mask off, and you realize, oh, that's not Peter Parker. Would you be disappointed? Yeah. Would you be a little? Would you still want to think that he was Spider Man? Probably. You'd be like, okay, I, I didn't see that. Put the mask back on. You're Spider Man. Just let me live in this fantasy for as long as I can. I'm standing in the presence of Spider Man. The people of Lystra. They wanted to believe that Paul and Barnabas were Spider-Man and Iron Man, or whatever, Zeus and Hermes. This was such a joyful thing for them to be honored by the presence of their gods that it wasn't easy for them to just be like, oh, oh, okay, you're not Zeus and Hermes. Okay, you're just two men. It was not going to be easy for Paul and Barnabas to convince them, no, we're not. We're not gods. We're not. And so here in Lystra would be a prime place for any Jewish opposition to come and say, look what they're doing. They're making you think that they're Zeus and Hermes. Oh. And so it's no wonder that in this place, Paul is stoned. They're so upset because they, have, they feel that they have been insulted and humiliated, really. Even though Paul and Barnabas weren't the ones saying that they were Zeus and Hermes. But they should have known better looking like they did with those beards and Paul being athletic and being the one who speaks. They should have known that that's what Zeus and Hermes do and that don't they know the story of Philemon and Bacchus and how they came down and, and they, they blessed the people? And so you know, we've been so hospitable. We've welcomed you into our town. Like, like this, was a, this was a powder keg of a place that obviously led to a stoning, which, kids, if you don't want to know what a stoning is, it's very painful. You don't want to experience a stoning. <laughs> okay. Verse 19. But Jews came from Antioch and Iconium. And having persuaded the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. Now, this likely did not happen quickly. This happens in quick succession in these verses, but it probably didn't happen quickly. There, there must have been time. They must have been in Lystra long enough and preaching enough that word got back to Iconium and Antioch, and deliberation happened, and people were sent to come back to Iconium and Lystra, which is not... It's far away, and we'll, we'll get to that here in a little in a little bit. Um, actually, we, we can talk about that now too. How how many miles do you think Paul and Barnabas were walking in this area on this journey? How many miles? How many miles would you want to walk to do a missionary journey? Give me a number. 50 miles, that's how much, how many miles you, that's a long, that's a long walk, right? Okay. Do you have any idea how many miles they were walking on this trip? They were walking probably 400 miles. Yeah. Going from Perga, the port city, up to Pisidian Antioch was about... 80 miles, going from Antioch to Iconium was around 90 miles, 
from Iconium to Lystra and Derby was likely another 100 miles. And when their time was done, instead of returning to Caesarean Antioch by way of Tarsus, which is where Paul's from, they were much closer to Tarsus at this point when they were in Derby later on in the chapter. Instead of going there, they went back. So the, the, one, the, the end trip was 300 miles, give or take, and they decided to walk back. So maybe 500 miles, who knows? Like it was walking. So here we see these Jews coming from Antioch and Iconium. It took them a while, maybe a couple weeks, a week to, to walk from Antioch to Iconium, and then another week to walk from Iconium to where they were in Lystra. So they were there for a while. That's all, that's all I'm trying to say. They were there for a while. And so this didn't happen quickly. Um, again, the population wanted Zeus and Hermes, and they were disappointed um, that, that Paul and Barnabas were just dudes, regular dudes, <laughs> just like them. But when the disciples gathered about him, so he's, he's stoned and he's outside, they think he's dead. It says he rose up and entered the city. What's likely is that he didn't just come in and go, ha, you didn't kill me. It's more likely that this was under cover of darkness, because uh, if he came back to, a, to a, pe a people who had just stoned him, do you think they would just be like, oh, shoot, <laughs> we didn't finish the job. Hey, you want some soup? No. They would have been a little upset and they wanted, wanted, wanted to complete it. So instead, cover of darkness, and then again, he probably got another re referral of where to go next. <clears throat> um, and at this point, since in, in all great movies where the hero is thought dead, the enemy is like, okay, we're done. And they return home. And they think he's dead. So from this point on, um, his enemies think he's dead. So he's, about, he's able to go and effect some more positive change where he goes. But, but also takes a big risk on his return trip. He's going right back through all these places, strengthening the congregations as he goes. This is, this is more like a Liam Neeson moment where he's just like coming in like, oh, you thought I was dead, right? And they're like in shock, like, what? How can we, we you never die, you know, like, whatever. <laughs> I watch too many movies, don't I, Tara? Yeah, it's a problem. It's a real problem. Um, <clears throat> um, so in, in, we see in Galatians chapter 6, uh, again, Galatians was written in response to this missionary trip. Like, he went here, helped to strengthen and create some congregations, and then after he left, he got word that things weren't going well, so he wrote back. And in Galatians 6, uh, verse 17, he says, From now on, let no one cause trouble for me, for I bear on my body the marks of Yeshua. I think that that stoning is what he's referring to. He was permanently scarred from that stoning, and he's, he wears the mark. He bears the marks of Yeshua. Um, and it happened in Galatia, and that's why he's bringing it up in the letter to the Galatians. <clears throat> uh, verse 21. When they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch. Again, at some point, they had made the decision, um, even though they were going in the direction of Tarsus, which was Paul's hometown, and he would have been fine there if he had gone that way, and it wasn't, it wasn't that far. At some point on this journey, they knew that they were going to be going back. Maybe at this point, they, they, they were walking and they saw the... the um, well, the, the Cilician Gates, I think it was the, 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 the roadway that goes from Derby to Tarsus. They stopped, and they just didn't feel right. They're like, you know, we got to go back through. we got to go back through, go back the way we came, and strengthen these people. Uh, because there's, there's just, the enemy is working hard to keep this seed from taking root. And so they, they made the decision to go back the way they came. <clears throat> um, uh, when they had preached the gospel at the city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch. Verse 22, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. And when they had appointed elders for them in every congregation with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. Um, seeing just how how much opposition there was in, in the violent response of certain groups. 
they realized they had to go through and strengthen these congregations, especially these congregations uh, in these towns, in Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch. Um, I, don't, I don't know if, if they go back and do this much with other places, but they went and visited again. When, when the, the report from Galatians wasn't good, they didn't go back and visit, they sent a letter, so they didn't go back. Uh, but at least at this point, they're like, oh, there are some things we know now after going through Lystra and that experience. That we got to go back through and strengthen these communities once more before we head home. So something, something was in them, some decision they had made to do so. Um, this here in Galatia is where we get Paul's standard for appointing elders, too. Again, another reason why Galatia is a very special place for this this whole ministry and outreach to the Gentiles. This is where this, for these congregations, is where Paul shares his standard of appointing elders that we have in 1 Timothy. Timothy, of course, who is from Galatia. <clears throat> and I, I encourage you to read that, uh, 1 Timothy 3, 2 through 7. There is, I think, an, an unusual arrangement of groups. And we've talked about this a little before in past weeks about how, you know, in our, in our context, we've got, we've got church buildings um, or we've got home fellowships or, or there's a, like a parish community uh, where we have a place to go to do some of the things. And that place is the place that's associated with the people who are in leadership over us too. And we're a part of that community Maybe we're part of that neighborhood, but we're also part of this church group or whatever. So we, there's certain ways in which we can organize these groups of people, right? This is unusual to us. So it says they were, they were going through appointing elders to these congregations, but in a lot of these places, there was already a what? There was a synagogue and a Jewish community. So who were these elders and what was their role in that community with a synagogue and such, right? So it's, it's a little unusual in how this would have worked out. Um, local synagogues were still the place used for what? what? What would you go to a synagogue for? Prayer and to hear the word and worship, right? So you would go, you would go there for that, that, those three things. Um, and then you would gather privately in homes. This was not unusual to Galatia. Gathering privately in homes for the other devotions of breaking bread, fellowship, and teaching from an appointed leader or where they would review the things that Paul and Barnabas had shared with them, the, the teaching of the emissaries, right? Still, but they were still a part of what? And these, they, they had these groups and they had their elders who were over them, but they were still a part of the broader what? Jewish community. They were still a part of the broader Jewish community. They would still go to the synagogue. They would still engage in the marketplace with these people. They were small in number, small enough in number, church or small home fellowships of a congregation. And one of the challenges we have at Beth the Coon, it's not a challenge, it's just something we have to keep an eye on and, and know how this is organized and arranged. Beth the Coon has its eldership. It could be a problem if a home fellowship has its own eldership to whom those people are under authority. You see what I'm getting at? Like there, there could be conflict here. We don't have that presently, by the grace of God. But we can see how this arrangement, how appointing elders, Paul and Barnabas appointing elders, um, strengthening them, could eventually lead to a conflict with the local Jewish community. Because no, no responsible or effective leadership should accept an eldership within their fold that leads people in a different way, right? So there's this, 
Again, because this is all unprecedented. This is all unprecedented. There's this potential for confusion and mis- mishmash and, and a mixing of things. And like, who, who are we under? Who's under our authority? And whose authority are we under? Like, you're my elder, but, but he's the rabbi. Like, right? It's just, it could be disjarring. So that's kind of the reality on the ground here. They're going back through and appointing elders because they realize these groups of people, these young, new to the faith groups, are going to need some help. And so we're going to appoint some elders, even if down the road it leads to some separation or schism or whatever. Like, it's worth it to get these people set up with leadership who can help bring them along, nurture them in the faith, and and teach them what they need to know. Does that make sense? Yep. Uh, Moving on. Uh, Verse 24, then they passed through Pisidia and came to uh, Pamphylia, and when they had spoken in the word in Perga, they went down to Atalia, and from there they sailed to Antioch, where they had been commended to the grace of God for the work that they had fulfilled. And verse 27, and when they arrived and gathered the congregation together, they declared all that God had done with them and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. This is the, the, um, the first time using this kind of language, opening a door of faith to the Gentiles, which is a, a, an unusual phrase. Um, and of course, the Antioch disciples would have rejoiced in what they'd been a part of bringing about, right? Like any time, so uh, Gabby Walkley has another opportunity to go do some mission work this year through CVCA, and we're gonna help, we're gonna um, put the word out and, and hopefully um, our congregation can help support that. But what we would love is, is for these people we send, these sent ones, to come back and tell us what God had done, right? So the disciples in Antioch, in Syrian Antioch, were probably just thrilled over the moon that they were a part of this, even though they were just the ones to lay on hands, to pray, to commission, and to send out. Paul and Barnabas are coming back and telling them some good news about how God is moving in the world. That is so encouraging. And um, I, just, I just love that. Um, and then last verse, and they remained no little time with the disciples. So a little subcontext to that verse. Paul gets the report from Galatia and sent his letter to them during this time. He's come back. He stayed there for a while. He gets reports back, which would not have been very long after coming back, probably, that there was just some disruption. Um, and I encourage you, we won't do it here today, but I encourage you to read the first chapter of Galatians. Knowing this context now of, of Acts 14, um, and even Acts 13, but Acts 14 especially, because this is when he's in Galatia, read Acts or, or read Galatians 1, and that will help you have, a, I think, a, a more proper context to what Galatians is all about, because it is a very misunderstood epistle. But knowing that, again, the... the the controversy isn't Yeshua as Messiah, isn't Yeshua's death, burial, and resurrection. It is the involvement of the Gentiles in this established Jewish community. And all the, thing, all the things that they try to do, the, these Jewish leaders who are so opposed to that, mixing of races or mixing of, of ethnicities or, or of people groups, what they'll do to try to, to thwart the, the work of God. Okay? So read Galatians 1. It's not very long. So here's, here's, a, here's a question. Um, Paul, Paul faces a serious theological problem because of the Galatians. If the message of Paul's adversaries is that Gentiles can't be saved aside from full conversion to Judaism, and this is what we'll see in Galatians, but the word of God... Um, especially in Isaiah, says Israel will be a light to the nations so that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. What is the problem? And literally, what doesn't add up? It's a math. This is a math problem. How many of you kids are good at math? Okay. Two, three, four. Okay. If... If the, if the Jewish leaders feel that 
Gentiles can't be saved, and so they must be converted to Judaism. So Gentiles over here, Jews over here. If the Gentiles need to become Jews, but God said that the the Israelites are to be a light to the Jews, what are there not going to be any more of over time? Gentiles. In their mind, it, it, is a, it is one or the other. You're either a Gentile who isn't saved, or you're a Gentile who was saved by becoming a Jew. There's no third option for them. It's a math problem. That's what Paul's facing here. His message is, no, you don't have to become a Jew to be saved. And it's just not, it's just not adding up. In their minds, even though it's simple math. If you're requiring Gentiles to become Jews, there'll be no more Gentiles. Period. So what's the point? Then we can't, then the, the, the prophecy cannot be fulfilled that there's a light to the nations. It doesn't say a light to the nations so that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth to convert all Gentiles to Jews. That's not the message of the gospel. It's that you don't have to be a full convert to Judaism. This is for all. It'll come through the Jewish people, but the Gentiles can be saved as well. Does that make sense? That, that's, that is, the, that is the, the serious theological problem of Galatians. And Paul got a taste of that on this missionary journey as he's seeing things play out. And, and this open door of faith to the Gentiles. Like, oh my goodness. Like, okay, here's a people who have absolutely no familiarity with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We've got to rethink... We've got to rethink our strategy here, guys. Like, we've got to go in and we've got to start from ground zero and build there. And you know what? That's going to take so much of my time. That's what I'm going to commit to. I'm going to do that, right? So, any any questions, any thoughts about that? There's a, there's a lot in this chapter. It's a lot of cool stuff in this chapter. Um. I, I, I tend to think, you know, how is it that, how is it that I'm being exclusive? How how is it that I could be better disciple of Yeshua by being less exclusive, but also understanding that there is a there is a distinction, like, but it's 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 a confusing thing, and we can see how in, how in Galatia. There are people who just couldn't think of a third option. Like they couldn't see that this was possible. Was that the fault of Paul, not being able to communicate it effectively? I don't know. Maybe he didn't know his audience as well as he did, especially in Lystra, where he's like, hey, they're responding. Hey, we're, all right, they're, they're lifting us up on chairs. We're going down the road. Hey, this is working out great. Like, <laughs> oh, no, they're going to sacrifice animals to us. They think we're gods. Oops. I don't know. Just something to think about. Um, Good chapter. So do you like Acts as much as I do? Man, this is like my favorite book. This is so awesome. And to be seeing it with new eyes this time around has just been overwhelming to me at times. So any questions or comments? Any thoughts? Anything else? Yeah, Kim. So she shared, the, the, the book is called Creating a Life That Matters. Yeah. So basically, Kim, for those of you who are watching, Kim shared that there is a slower pace to this life. And someone shared with me a video recently. Um, I can't remember the name of it, but the, the, cause it, the, the actual official video was something else. But what I saw was something called God's Speed. Did you see it too? You sent it. Oh, yeah, you sent it to, Grant and Robin sent it to me. And yeah, so I watched it. 
If we look back and see how far these guys were walking, how long it must have taken, how, do you know how, how many of you know how fast people walk on average, miles per hour? Was that? Two, two, three miles an hour, okay. We need to be better at slowing down to catch up to God. This was taking weeks to travel from city to city. Saul was in Tarsus before, you know, chapters ago, he was in Tarsus for like 10, 12 years before, before the commission he was given actually started to be executed. He was told he was going to do a thing, but then he went away and was studying and grappling with this for a decade before he was actually sent out to effect positive change. And where they were going, they had to slow down. And it was an arduous journey. And even when they got there, there was no guarantee that they were going to be welcomed. But they were walking everywhere. Walking, walking, walking. Slowing down is something that we've, we are not accustomed to in our culture. For better or worse. Probably mostly for worse. And there's a lot of us, I know a lot of us in our congregation, especially, and, and, and around the world, or not, around, just around in our culture, who are wanting to slow down, who are wanting to get back to a slower pace. Because what has this fast pace gotten us? What has it got? Zero. Like, not, not a lot of good. So, yeah, thank you for sharing. That, that's... That, that's another important message and lesson of this chapter, is just how far they had to walk and how long they had to take to do it. And that they didn't have a smartphone to look at on the way. They had each other to talk to and the world around them to look at and some food to eat, clothes on their back. Um, yeah, there are some people in the world who, who try to keep no, no possessions. And we think of that as crazy. But I know you think this, because I think it too. Sometimes I am insanely jealous of the people who have uh, a four-room house, one car, maybe no TV. Sorry, kids. A few appliances, a bookcase full of books, a yard to play in, like just simple. I read, um, uh, for Christmas, I got a book called The Little Red Schoolhouse by Eric Sloan. He wrote these books back in the 60s. He was an illustrator and a writer, and he was talking about The Little Red Schoolhouse and how, how education has changed over time in America. And that when we look back and think of one-room schoolhouses, we think, oh, that's crazy. That's, that was the worst way to do it. But... It produced the kind of people who built America, right? But it was simple. It was simpler, smaller. The kids had to walk there. Sometimes they had, George Washington rowed in a boat down a river to get there. A child rowing in a boat to get to school, and he was happy to be there. It was a different time, simpler time, slower, maybe more in line with God's pace of life than we are now. I know there's a lot of us, maybe most of us. I would say most of us in this room, <laughs> and maybe most of us in our congregation are the friends we know who are, are feeling that pull to a, a godly pace of life, God's speed of life. And I think we'll, we'll, we'll need each other to help slow down, right? It's, it's, not, it's, it's not easy to, to not go fast. Anyway, any, anything else? Nothing? Okay. All right, well, thank you. Let me uh, close in prayer, and then I'll uh, turn off the live stream, and we'll do some announcements. Father in heaven, we thank you again for today, for your Shabbat, for the light you shine, not only outside right now, but the light you shine through your word, um, the light you shine um, in our understandings, and how you can, through your spirit, Help us make connections from the abstract and spiritual into the things that are actual and, and physical and 
practical in our lives and we can see how they all work together. Um, and that, and we, we praise you and we hope that you will help us slow down and live our lives more at your pace, at your speed, so that we don't get too far ahead of what it is you want to accomplish in our lives in the timing that you've ordained. I thank you again for Paul and Barnabas, for Luke, for who wrote this down, that we could read about these accounts um, and just rejoice in how you brought about uh, the salvation of all people. We thank you and we praise you in Yeshua's name. Amen.